First part of chapter 11 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Chapter 11. Some Abstract Conditions of the Ideal. Sidenote. The ultimate end, a resultant. Reason's function is to embody the good, but the test of excellence is itself ideal. Therefore, before we can assure ourselves that reason has manifested in any given case, we must make out the reasonableness of the ideal that inspires us. And in general, before we can convince ourselves that a life of reason or practice guided by science and directed toward spiritual goods is at all worth having, we must make out the possibility and character of its ultimate end. Yet each ideal is its own justification, so that the only sense in which an ultimate end can be established and become a test of general progress is this, that a harmony and cooperation of impulses should be conceived, leading to the maximum satisfaction possible in the whole community of spirits affected by our action. Now, without considering for the present any concrete utopia, such, for instance, as Plato's Republic or the heavenly beatitude described by theologians, we may inquire what formal qualities are imposed on the ideal by its nature and function by the relation it bears to experience and to desire. Side note demands the substance of ideals. The ideal has the same relation to given demands that the reality has given perceptions. In the face of the ideal, particular demands forfeit their authority, and the goods to which a particular being may aspire cease to be absolute. Nay, the satisfaction of desire comes to appear an indifferent or unholy thing when compared or opposed to the ideal to be realized. So precisely, in perception, flying impressions come to be regarded as illusory when contrasted with a stable conception of reality. Yet, of course, flying impressions are the only material out of which that conception can be formed. Life itself is a flying impression, and had we no personal and instant experience importuning us at each successive moment, we should have no occasion to ask for a reality at all, and no materials out of which to construct such a gratuitous an idea. In the same way, present demands are the only materials and occasions for any ideal. Without demands, the ideal would have no locus standi, or foothold in the world, no power, no charm, and no prerogative. If the ideal can confront particular desires and put them to shame, that happens only because the ideal is the object of a more profound and voluminous desire, and embodies the good which they blindly and perhaps deviously pursue. Demands could not be misdirected, goods sought could not be false, if the standard by which they are to be corrected were not constructed out of them. Otherwise each demand would render its object a detached, absolute and unimpeachable good. But when each desire in turn has singed its wings and retired before some dissolution, Reflection may set in to suggest residual satisfactions that may still be possible, or some shifting of the ground by which much of what was hoped for may be yet be attained. Side note. Discipline of the will. Side note. Demands made practical and consistent. The force for this new trial is but the old impulse renewed. This new hope is a justified remnant of the old optimism. Each passion, in this second campaign, takes the field conscious that it has indomitable enemies and ready to sign a reasonable peace. 
and even to capitulate before superior forces. Such tameness may be at first merely a consequence of exhaustion and prudence, but a mortal will, though absolute in its deliverances, is very far from constant, and its sacrifices soon constitute a habit, its exile a new home. The old ambition, now proved to be unrealizable, begins to seem capricious and extravagant. The circle of possible satisfactions becomes the field of conventional happiness. Experience, which brings about this humbler and more prosaic state of mind, has its own imaginative fruits. Among those forces which compelled each particular impulse to abate its pretensions, the most conspicuous were other impulses, other interests active in oneself and in one's neighbors. When the power of these alien demands is recognized, they begin, in a physical way, to be respected. When an adjustment to them is sought, they begin to be understood, for it is only by studying their expression and tendency that the degree of their hostility can be measured. But to understand is more than to forgive, it is to adopt, and the passion that thought merely to withdraw into a sullen and maimed self-indulgence can feel itself expanded by sympathies which in its primal vehemence it would have excluded altogether. Experience, in bringing humility, brings intelligence also personal interests begin to seem relative factors only in a general voluminous welfare expressed in many common institutions and arts moulds for whatever is communicable or rational in every passion each original impulse when trimmed down more or less according to its degree of savageness can then inhabit the state and every good when sufficiently transfigured can be found again in the general idea. The factors may indeed often be unrecognizable in the result, so much does the process of domestication transform them. But the interests that animated them survive this discipline, and the new purpose is really esteemed, else the ideal would have no moral force. An ideal representing no living interest would be irrelevant to practice, just as a conception of reality would be irrelevant to perception which should not be composed of the materials that sense supplies, or should not re-embody actual sensations in an intelligible system. Side note: The ideal natural. Here we have, then, one condition which the ideal must fulfill, it must be a resultant or synthesis of impulses already afoot. An ideal out of relation to the actual demands of living beings is so far from being an ideal that it is not even a good. The pursuit of it would be not the acme but the atrophy of moral endeavor. Mysticism and asceticism run into this danger when the intent to be faithful to a supreme good too symbolically presented breeds a superstitious repugnance toward everything naturally prized. So also an artificial scepticism can regard all experience as deceptive, by contrasting it with the chimera of an absolute reality. As an absolute reality would be indescribable and without a function in the elucidation of phenomena, so a supreme good which was good for nobody would be without conceivable value. Respect for such an idol is a dialectical superstition, and if zeal for that shibboleth should actually begin to inhabit the exercise of intelligent choice or the development of appreciation for natural pleasures, it would constitute a reversal of the life of reason, which, if persistently indulged in, could only issue in madness or revert to imbecility. End of chapter 11, part 1